I don't know if there is any single venture that a human being can pursue that creates as much anxiety, excitement, frustration, or joy as parenting. I truly don't know. I can't think of anything else that creates that kind of feeling. I think many parents in here will relate to the story I'm going to tell you. So there's... There was this man named George, and he decided he needed to go grocery shopping. And so he decides to go, and he is pushing his cart along. But alongside all, some of the stuff he starts to pick up, he has got a screaming baby in the car seat sitting in his grocery cart. Now, for many of us who are parents, that immediately raises our anxiety level like to, you know, 11, okay? Like a really high level, all right? And we are just, we're feeling that. So George is going through... Um, He's going through the, the store and he starts to just say, you know, don't yell. Don't get too excited. He sounds like he's like, don't, don't get excited, George. Don't yell, George. So this lady thinking, oh man, this is such a, a nice man who is trying to be patient with his little child comes up to him and says, you ought to be commended for this. And you know, you know, he's been saying, don't, don't yell, George. And she goes, lady, I'm the one who's George. Okay, <laughs> I'm not trying to calm the child. I'm trying to calm myself here, okay? And I think we relate to that story because as parents, we've all been there. We've all been in those situations and we think, you know, before we have kids, we're like, yeah, I'm gonna handle it. Like, I'm gonna be awesome. I'm gonna do that perfectly. I'm gonna, I know exactly what I'm gonna do in that situation. Then when we get to that actual situation, it's like, we probably more handle it around here, okay? Where <laughs> we kind of, we're not totally perfect in how we do it. But this is a desire. Like, we have a desire to be good parents. It's like a really fringe few group of people who don't, want to be good parents who aren't interested and that's a really tragic thing but I think the question that a lot of us ask is how can I do this better how can I be a better parent but I think for those of us who are Christians the better question is how can I do this in a way that glorifies God and raises up my kids to follow Christ that's the important thing. That's the real crux of the issue when we get down to it is that we need to be thinking about how am I going to raise my children to be followers of Christ. And so all the things I'm going to be talking about today, I want you to hear me not as someone who thinks he is the uh, resident expert on parenting. I've only been doing it just short of two years. Okay, I don't have it all figured out. I am simply a person delivering a message from God's word to tell us and like basically say to us, this is what we need to be doing. This is what God designed for us. This is what God desires for us to do. And so now let's go and do it. And I also want to address two different demographics that I know are in this room that might tune out because of the fact that they're not parents. Okay. First of all, if you are currently not a parent and this is something that is, you're saying, oh, that's so far in the future. I'll learn about it then. I don't need to worry about it now. Let me just tell you, the earlier you start to implement these things in your personal life, the sooner that you will, or the easier it will be to implement that as a parent. And then secondly, for those of you who might be empty nesters or have moved on from that parent stage or moved on from the parent stage or have never had kids and now it's too late, you're not gonna have kids, here's the thing. The beauty of the church is that God designed the church to be full of people making disciples, raising up spiritual kids to follow Christ. And so your responsibility is still to be a spiritual parent. So take some of these lessons in that way that it's saying, okay, if I want to be a good, godly, spiritual parent to a bunch of young people or to other, uh, to young couples or to people in my church, then I need to know how to do this. I need to know how to parent them in the right way. And so here's kind of the main thing we're going to talk about this morning is that healthy parenting is designing all things related to your home so that you are cultivating a lasting legacy of faith in your children. Let me read that one more time. Healthy parenting is designing all things related to your home so that you are cultivating a lasting legacy of faith in your children. And so this morning, we're going to look at three different ways that we can do that, that we ought to spiritually lead our home as parents so that there is this lasting legacy of faith in the family. And so uh, right now, I invite you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, you will notice that if you were here last week, that this is the same passage that Pastor Ron went over last week, but he was talking about it with moms, and this week, I'm going to talk about it and get in, like, diving deep into it and talking about parenting principles and what we need to be doing. So we're going to dive deeper into this passage. And so while you're turning to Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, there is 
There are some brown hardcover back Bibles in the seats in front of you. If you did not bring a Bible, turn to page 182 while you're doing that. And so let me just tell you, Deuteronomy, uh, the book, is a series of speeches that Moses gave in order to prepare the nation of Israel to enter into the promised land that God had been promising to them for a long time. And so he's telling them, he's, he's telling them, be faithful to the covenant that God has given you. Be faithful to it. This is what you need to do. This is how you ought to live. Because in their way, the covenant, the Mosaic covenant, as this is called, was conditioned upon their obedience. Basically, it's very clear when you look through the law, you see these moments where it says, if you obey, here's the blessings. If you disobey, here are the curses. Here are the things that are going to come your way if you disobey. And spoiler alert, if you haven't read the Bible, they go this way, okay? <laughs> they don't obey and God kicks them out of the promised land, okay? And so what we're going to see today is we're going to see this is the ultimate design. This is what God has desired for us. This is what he wants us to do as parents. So let's go ahead and begin to read. We're going to read verses 1 through 3 to start. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. And so he gives, he says, these are the commands, decrees, and laws. Over the course of the entire book, which is 34 chapters long, it's all these speeches about how these different laws that they were given and how they were supposed to act. So for us as Christians, because we live in a new, test, a new covenant world, we are not like conditioned upon obedience for God to bless us because in our world, it's now we live in the new covenant that we put our faith in Christ, that he put himself on that cross on our behalf because of our sin so that we could be made right with him, so that we could be justified before him. And then as a result, we were given a new life. And so this, it's a whole different, whole different scenario, a whole different covenant going on here. And so we have to ask the question, well, then what are the decrees, commands, laws for us as Christians? Well, Jesus summarizes it in two ways. First, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Okay, and we'll talk about that verse in a minute. What, because this is, it's in this passage where that comes from. Okay, but the second one is to love your neighbor as yourself. And you can actually boil down the law and even the Ten Commandments. You can boil down the whole thing on those two ideas. To love God and to love your neighbor. So these are the things that we ought to be looking for. This is what we need to be doing. Okay, so then Moses is giving these commands because he was directed by God to give them to the nation of Israel. But look at what he says. And the purpose is not just so that, you know, there's purposes of you may enjoy a long life so that it may go well with you. The primary purpose that he puts here, the first thing he says is so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God. That's the primary purpose of why Moses is giving these commands is so that there would be this, like I said, a lasting legacy of faith. And so that's actually what our primary purpose is as, as parents is to continue this in order to, to push this on our kids, to, to let them know this is what you need to be doing. This is how you ought to be living because we want them to fear the Lord. And now I got to explain this word for a minute because I think often we, we want to make God nice sometimes. We want to make him like this fluffy teddy bear that gives you, just wants to give you hugs, okay? And yes, God is a loving God. God is a caring God. He is compassionate. But there's also an element of fear that comes with God. When you see the Old Testament prophets come before God, and even a couple times it happens in the New Testament, what they do immediately is, bam, they are on their face because they're terrified. Because they're, they're coming for, before a perfect, holy God knowing that they're not. And that's a terrifying thing to come before something perfect and holy. And it's basically like it exposes them and just lays bare everything. One of the prophets even says, woe is me for I am a man of unclean lips. He's basically, I'm, I'm, I'm exposed here. I should be dead, but God is not killing me because I am standing before him as imperfect. But we also have to remember with fear as Christians, we understand that perfect love casts out fear. This is something that John says in 1 John 4. And so we don't need, the, as Christians, when we give our lives to Christ, everything that, you know, we would fear of being exposed has been paid for by Jesus. And so now we can come before him in true 
fear, which is about reverence and also recognizing that he is a great and powerful God. So we don't want to soften that term too much because we still, as Christians, need to fear him in a sense that we are obeying him in such a manner that we know we're going to stand before him to give an account for how we lived our life. That, and that, for me, that's a fearful thing because there are many times where I'm sitting there and I think about things I've done and I go, wow, I'm gonna have to, we're going to have to have a chat about that someday, me and God, face to face. I'm not going to like that conversation. Even though I know that I'm covered by the blood of Christ, it's still not comfortable. Okay? So then he says this as well, that you may enjoy long life. When he says you may enjoy long life, he's not guaranteeing them that they are going to live till they're 80 or 90 years old. Okay, that's not, it's not that kind of promise. It's about the long life and the survival of the nation. And so it was important for the nation to survive, the nation of Israel to survive, that they passed on the legacy of faith. And we see why that is when they didn't survive. It was because they didn't pass that on and they started worshiping other gods. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, how that works out. But he makes sure to say, okay, he says this phrase, it's really cool. He says, hear Israel. We'll talk about hear in a minute when we get to verses four, or verse four and five. But then he says, hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you. He's inviting them into this. And we have to understand this. Like this is not just this threat of like, you better obey me or else I'm coming. I'm gonna get you. Okay, it's not this like threat kind of thing. It's this invitation into living the way that God has designed us to live. God has designed us to live in particular ways and we often as humans are saying, no, I'm gonna go do what I want. I don't wanna go do that. I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna choose my own thing. I don't wanna do that. But God is saying, no, I'm not out here to kill your joy. I'm out here to help you flourish and to find true joy in me and be able to flourish in that. God has a design specifically for us. And so that's why it goes well with us. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But uh, let's, let's look at what our first way is that we can create a lasting legacy of faith. And that is that parents lead their children to obey the commands of God. That we take it upon ourselves that we say, you know what? This is what my house is gonna be about. We're gonna be about teaching and knowing and understanding the commands of God in our world. This is what we're going to do. This is what our house is going to be like. You can even hear it in the scriptures when Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That you determine this is what we are going to do. This is how we are going to live. You don't let, you don't just simply give them away to somebody else to teach them, whether it's a friend or a pastor or a teacher, um, because it won't work. And, and it's not how things are designed. It's designed that parents are to be the ones to do this. So in preparing for our firstborn, Avery, to come, we read this book together while we would drive, because we were living here, but uh, Lindsay still had insurance up in Vancouver, where we used to live. And so we had to drive to our appointments every week up to Vancouver. And so we, uh, on the way, we would read this book. And so this book is called Shepherding a Child's Heart, and it's by a man named Ted Tripp. We read this book as kind of preparing ourselves. Okay, we're, we're about to enter into this crazy venture of parenting. We need to learn what this is. Like We need to learn how to do this. And his main kind of point that he is talking about throughout this book is that we as parents are to be pointing our children constantly to the gospel and everything that we do, including the way that we might discipline and correct behavior. We are trying to basically point them to the fact that they have a sin nature, they have an issue in their heart that they cannot fix, that they need the Redeemer Jesus to take care of, that they need to trust in Jesus and that Jesus gives them a new heart. So the thing we say with Avery all the time is when she starts to whine and starts to get upset and make bad choices, we look at her and we say, Avery, that shows a yucky heart. Like we're putting it in her terms so she hears it, you know. Yuck, you're, showing, you're showing that you have a yucky heart. And that doesn't make mommy and daddy very happy. That doesn't make God very happy. But, and then we talk about, and so when we talk with her and we start to correct her, we start talking about how Jesus took the penalty for her even despite her yucky heart. And it's this beautiful thing that after a while, like I don't think, I truly don't think she gets it yet because she's not even two. But we still get these cute moments of like, you know, she'll say, Daddy, love Jesus. And then she'll go, Avery, love Jesus. You know, like we're like, oh, that's precious. We love that. I don't, I'm not gonna, you know, count that as saving faith quite yet, but like, it's still really cute. Like, I really enjoy it. 
But kind of the thing that, doc, that Dr. Tripp talks about is this idea of what he calls the circle of safety. And you'll see it on your screen. The circle of safety is about living within the realm of obeying God, okay? That you are honoring, that, that first one is honor your father and mother because God has given them to you to be the representative authority in your life to the kids, you know? And they now, if, now they obey them because they're in some ways obeying God. And that when they walk out of that, when they disobey and dishonor their parents, that they're basically now saying, okay, all right, hardship, difficulty, come get me. Like, they're asking for it. They're asking for problems to happen. And so what we're doing with discipline and correction and teaching the commands of God is trying to get them to come back over here to the circle of safety. Now, this isn't necessarily a guarantee that your kids are never going to have any hardships ever in their life because we live in a broken world and those things just happen. They're unexplainable, they're hard, suffering happens. But we wanna at least get them into a position where they are following the optimal path, the design that God has put forth for them so that they can avoid as much difficulty as possible, especially the self-inflicted difficulty and hardship that can happen when you walk away from God's way. And so that's our first way, teaching the commands of God. Let's continue, verse four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. So these two verses are called the Shema. And the reason they call it that is because of the first word, which is to hear. Hear, O Israel. Okay, and the word hear in, in Hebrew, this word Shema, is more than just hearing. Okay, as parents, we understand this, that there is a difference with our kids when they are hearing us and when they're listening, right? Like, they're, like there's this moment where we're saying something and you can tell it's going right through, okay? They're not paying attention. They don't care, all right? And we don't like that. That drives us crazy, okay? But there is a moment where you can see that all of a sudden they're listening. And for the Hebrews, the idea of listening is directly tied to doing. It's basically two sides of the same coin. That if you're going to listen, if you're gonna listen, that means you're also going to do what is being put forth in front of you. So that's why they say this thing. And it's actually a, it was a ritual prayer that they would say, the Shema, and they would say it pretty much every day to remind themselves of what they believe. Now, a lot of what I'm gonna cover right now, it comes from uh, this, this series of videos from the group called The Bible Project. Uh, they're based here in Portland. They make these amazing uh, graphic design videos that, are, that dis uh, describe biblical concepts. And so they did a whole series on the Shema and it's, Amazing, And so what I'm going to talk about today comes from that. I want to make sure I cite my source so you don't think I'm the one that's brilliant because I'm not, okay? <laughs> I'm not the one who found all this, okay? Um, and so here's what they say. They say, here the hero is, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord is, you know, his memorial name, this name Yahweh, which basically gives the concept of his self-eternal existence, that he doesn't need anybody to exist. He just is. He's just there. He, he is. Okay, that's where you get the phrase, the I am. Okay, that's where that comes from. Then it says, the Lord is one. It's more than just this phrase of like, we believe in one God and one God, and that's it. Like, we don't believe in multiple gods. It's actually more of a statement of saying, the Lord is one. Like, this is the one God that we are going to worship. Now, back in that day, they would oftentimes, you know, other cultures and other societies would have these little idols, these little statues that they would build, sometimes even big ones. Okay, they would build these statues and they would worship those as, you know, this is our physical representation of our God that we worship. Okay? And this, and this is something that we flat out just don't do in our culture. That we think that would be kind of, like our culture thinks that's kind of weird to, to have a little thing that we would worship. But ours in our culture in America is much more subtle and it's really dangerous. Because these kind of idols are things that are more like hidden, like within the heart that we could keep secret from other people and they wouldn't know, okay? They could be inside of our minds. We could be worshiping things like money, reputation, success, okay? That these are the ultimate things that I need to pursue these things in order for me to be happy or I need to give and spend all my time and my, and my resources in order to reach and get these things, okay? But I think as parents, what we often do is we start to worship our kids. And here's how we do that. We start to live vicariously through them and their success. 
You know, like where you start to hear about stories where parents uh, get in fights at a, you know, six-year-old t-ball game <laughs> over some calls or something. That's taking it too far, okay? Because they're six-year-olds, who cares? Like, let them have fun. Like, it's, let them have fun and play their best and do, do what they can, okay? But we start to build up, like, success. Like, it, like, their existence, their success is so important to me that it, I will do anything that it takes. Now, success in, is not, doesn't mean it's a bad thing, and we'll talk about this more later, but if we make it the ultimate thing and we don't focus in on raising our children to follow Christ, then that's where that becomes the idol. And we start to really desire for our kids to be this way, and we want them, even some of them are like, being well-behaved. That's a really hard one for me because it's like, oh, my kids, I want them to be well-behaved or else people are going to think I'm a terrible parent. Well, here's the thing. Kids are kids, and as we know from the Bible, kids have a sin nature, and they're going to do stuff that you can't explain, okay? It's going to just happen. They're just going to do it, okay? Not because you're not, because you're not teaching them, okay? Like if anybody in here has had a biter, you know, of a kid that's been a biter, you, you never modeled that at home, okay? I don't think anybody was walking around just chomping on people, okay? Like, it just comes out because of the anger. It's the sin nature. It's what happens, okay? And so that's, so that's where we have to say, we're going to worship God only. That's it. But then he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And so that word love is this very general term about affection. It can mean affection for your kids, for your parents, for a friend, for, uh, for your spouse. Very general term. But it's kind of giving the concept of loving God because he first loved you. And we believe that because, and we, that's in the New Testament because of what Christ did for us. But then he says, with all your heart. The heart is, to the Hebrews, the governing center of the entire person. Where everything comes from. For, for, you know, it says this in Proverbs. For the, you know, guard your heart above all else. For from it flow the wellsprings of life. So you guard it. You protect it. So that, because what comes out is, is, is what you let in. Okay, and so this, some of these things are included, like your character, your personality, your will, your, your mind, these kinds of things come out in your, from your heart. And it's about loving God with our will and our affections, that we would love him with, you know, our, our affections and with the way that we make our decisions. But then the next word is where it gets really confusing, with all your soul. That word soul in Hebrew is the word nephesh. It's not the word that we would think of for soul. They have a Hebrew word for that, where it's this immaterial thing that lives inside of a human body that someday when it dies, it separates, okay? They have a different word for that. This is the word nephesh, which quite literally means throat. So it sounds really strange when you translate it literally to say, love the Lord your God with all your throat. Just, just right here, just right, right in here. Just love him right here, okay? What he's talking about, what he means by that is actually the word nephesh is not necessarily the soul. It's your physical living being, that you have breath, that the air passes between the throat, okay? That you are a physically alive human being. And so that we are to love God with all of that part of us, our whole physical being. And then the last word, with all your strength, is actually this word meod, and it's not talking about physical strength, okay? Because sometimes, I think when I was a kid, I would hear this verse and I'd go, well, I got some work to do to love God with my strength because I am a weakling. Like, I am, this is trouble. The word is meod, and to best translate it is actually an adverb, and so actually what it does is it intensifies what has already been said. So kind of the best way to actually translate it is to say the word muchness. To love God with all your muchness. And basically it's like with every capacity, ability, opportunity that you have, that God has given you, with everything that you have, you love him. And so what this becomes is when you see this phrase, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, it's this concept of saying you love God with every bit and piece of your life that there is no area untouched in your life that you will love God with. You are to love God with everything, every little bit of yourself and with your life. And it's this beautiful concept. This is what we are to do. And so this is how we lead as parents. This is our second way is that we, that parents lead in the home to love God with their whole lives and worship him only. That we start to say, yeah, like I said before, we're going to teach the commands of God, but we're also going to love God. This is how we're going to do it. We're going to love God because he has loved us because of what he has done for us. 
and that we are going to properly order our priorities in our home so that it shows that we love God, that God comes first and foremost out of anything and everything else that we could possibly pursue in this life. God comes first. And we say, then it's family, then it's our jobs, then it's any other pursuits. Like we have to have these proper ordering of priorities. And so if there is anything that is preventing us from loving God first and foremost, that thing has got to go. We've got to cut it out. Because as Moses says later in this section, in Deuteronomy 6, he actually says to, that, that God is a jealous God. And it's not jealousy like, oh, I'm so jealous that they have that car, that house. That they're, you know, like an envious kind of a jealousy. It's a jealousy of basically saying like, I want to be the only God in their life. I don't want to have a competitor in their heart. And we have to remember, remember God designed us to live in this way. So it's good for us to have God be the only God of our life. But how we do this in particular, how we represent this is specifically by leading by example, because our children are like sponges. And when they are watching what we do, that is how they're going to act. And what I learned this week is something that has truly terrified me to my core as a parent thinking about it. Because studies have started to find, when you start to study the religiosity of youth, uh, of this generation, that a lot of them uh, give examples as to why they stopped in their faith, why they stopped going to church. It's because it's what they, they didn't see a priority in their parents' life. They didn't see their parents prioritize it. And so they said, well, if my parents didn't prioritize it, why, why should I? And so they've moved on. It's this terrifying study that basically if, if a family shows that this is like, as, like the most important thing that you do and that you are committed and actively involved in your congregation, that is the highest, that they, these are the children that are most likely to have their, your faith transmitted to them is if you are actively involved, if you are doing things, okay? If you are attending church. Look at this quote. This one, this is the quote that terrified me. Parents, for better or worse, are actually the most influential pastors of their children. Listen to this. Parents set a kind of glass ceiling of religious commitment above which their children rarely rise. Ouch. Okay. And here's, I'm going to just summarize it for you. Put it in my words. Say my religious commitment, you know, I would say it's right about here. I'm not, I'm not making an assessment. This is just hypothetical, okay? Say so if it's right here, okay? And I want my kids to be up here, like on fire for Jesus, like walking up to people, telling them about how much Jesus loves them and, and people are being saved and people come to know Jesus Christ through them and they're just on fire. They love Jesus and they don't, like, they, they make sure that they are waiting for that right man to marry, that they is, is a godly man, all those kinds of things, okay? And, there's, and this is who they are. But if I'm here, and I want them there. According to the study, that is not a very likely scenario that they'll rise above that. And so for me, that was convicting to think about, to say, wow, if I want my kids there, boy, I've got to get there. And the beautiful thing, keep this in mind, don't forget this, God gives you the grace to get there. God is the one who grows you. God is the one who does that work. So if you want that to happen, if you're taking inventory of yourself and you're saying, oh wow, there is a serious shortage in my life to see my kids get there. God, I need you to do it. And he is faithful. When we ask those kinds, ask in those kinds of prayers that God will do it. Because that's what he designed us for. That's what he wants. We're basically just asking him to do something that's right inside his heart. And so what we need to do is take inventory today. And if you're looking at your life and saying, my glass ceiling is pretty low, then you start to say, Jesus, start to work. I need you to work. And I promise you, he will be faithful to do it. And you can start to do it. Okay, last point real quick. Look at verse six. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And so remember, the heart is the governing center of the person that kind of dictates everything else around them. And so he's saying you need to have these commandments on your heart. Here's the problem that Israel had. 
when they disobeyed, God got pretty frustrated and said, okay, it's, it's, I got to follow through on what I said I would do. I was patient. I gave them time. I gave them chances to repent. They didn't do it. And so now I'm going to carry out what I said I would do, and I'm going to take them off into exile now. And so he does. But he gives them this promise as well. He says that he is someday, this is in Jeremiah chapter 31, that I will give them, I'm going to bring out a new covenant, and I will write the law on their hearts. It's a little bit different than just saying, like, follow the rules because that's what you're supposed to do, but to have the law written on your hearts. And the, the good news for us for who believe in Christ is that when we put our faith in Christ, when we believe in him and trust in him alone for salvation, that as a result, the Holy Spirit is then indwell and uh, in starts to indwell in our hearts. Literally, God himself dwelling on our hearts that will then remind us of the law from time to time that will also enable us and empower us to follow him and to do the things that he has called us to do. It's really important for us to understand them, that, that these commandments have been given to us, but we have been given a, something, a power to be able to handle it, to be able to obey and to, and to live in a way that God has asked us to live. But then he says to impress them on your children. Now, this isn't just a one-time statement of, okay, Kid, we're going to talk one time. This is the big talk. You need to love God with your whole life. The end. Have a nice day. Okay? Not one time. The impress idea is like a constant pushing, constant, continual pushing of these laws onto your children. And the word I'm going to start using for myself, because I think if I put a word to it, it helps me think about how I'm going to do this, is, is the word relentless. That no matter what, I'm going to be relentless in teaching my kids about what it means to follow Jesus. I'm going to keep pushing this in front of them. I'm going to keep pushing the gospel in front of them. That my greatest missionary field is right inside the walls of my own house. That I'm going to be teaching them about who Jesus is, how much he loves them, what he wants to do for them, to the point that they'll say, Dad, I'm tired of it. Can you please stop telling us about this? And then I'll say, too bad. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> Until you tell me that you like this, <laughs> like you genuinely like this, I'm going to keep going. And even then, I'm going to keep going because I'm, I'm telling you about Jesus. So this, and, and so then he uses this, these other concepts of talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. He's talking about these two ends of the spectrum of life and that it basically assumes both of those spec ends of the spectrum and everything in between. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Okay, both ends of the spectrum and everything in between. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. He's not being actually literal here. What he's doing is he's saying that this, these are ever in front of you. Always, you're putting these out in front of you. And then write them on the door frames of your house. You can have cute little scripture decorations on your walls. That's great. Make sure you're living it too, okay? That you're, and that you teach them why those things are there. But ultimately, the whole point of all this, this is our third way is that parents lead in using any and every opportunity to teach the ways of Jesus. So if you're in your car and you're teaching and you're driving your kids somewhere, you're teaching them about something, okay? You're telling them about something, okay? You're making dinner at home, you start teaching them, okay? Any and every opportunity that you possibly have, and especially when there's disappointment that comes into their life, when there's rejection that comes into their life, when there's heartache, heartbreak, all those kinds of things, every time, any and every opportunity to teach them about who Jesus is and what he has done for them and that you don't stop, that you are relentless and you never give up. And so there are some common objections that people have to this. So you might ask, what if my kids are older and I completely messed this up? And there's regret. Well, there's actually something in there uh, from the book I mentioned earlier, Dr. Tripp said, where he, uh, he had talked to some parents who were in this kind of situation and he, and he said to them, first off, start by apologizing and then start doing it. And he said that some of these kids who were really struggling with behavioral issues, that when the parents did this and made this effort, that the kids made a complete 180 degree turnaround beautiful thing that when the parents humbly came before them and said we're sorry we've done this wrong we want to do this right and so that so even if so even if you feel like you've messed it up you can start to do it now now here's the other question if you have a kid that's out of the home and you know they're not under your influence anymore in that way you pray 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 
You pull it out when you can. You don't, you know, shove it over their heads. But you pray. And you, you pray for that opportunity. And when that opportunity comes, you take it. You go for it right away. You might say, I don't know the Bible very well. How am I going to teach my children? It can literally look something as simple as this. That you spend time in the Bible. It might even be five minutes. You learn something. You're like, cool, that's awesome. Who's the first person I'm going to go tell about it? My kids. Okay? It can be as simple and quick as that. If you are that, like, um, if you lack that much confidence with the Bible. Now, let me just tell you. Build confidence. Remember, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. He can enable you to have some confidence with the Bible. So start diving in, digging in, finding ways to grow so that this becomes a more natural thing to you. And I promise you, the more you do it, repetition, the more you do it, it you'll get better at it. And it doesn't have to be something super in-depth or life-altering in that exact moment. It just needs to be something. Start by doing something. It's gonna be great. You might even say, okay, my kids won't pay attention during a Bible study time, family Bible study time. Um, let me just tell you, I completely understand this one because I, uh, uh, I worked in a daycare before I started working here. I was the assistant teacher in a four and five-year-old classroom and one of my re daily responsibilities was doing the Bible lesson for about, you know, usually 15 to 20 four and five-year-olds. You want to talk about attention problems? <laughs> like, and that's not to say, like, I'm not making this comparison game, like, uh, that's not my point at all. That it's like, if I could do it with those, you could do it with, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying is, if you can get just a brief moment of focus, <laughs> something that you have enough time to lay something before them and get something right in front of their face that teaches them about Jesus, you've won. Even if it lasts 30 seconds, you've, got, you've done something. Something has happened. Okay, and that was like every day with that Bible study time I do it at the daycare I worked at. Just little, little windows, okay? Little windows of opportunity. And so you just keep doing that. The next one, I'm on board, but, if, but I don't know if my spouse is. Let me just tell you, if this is you, I just, my heart breaks for you. That you don't feel like you have someone on board with you to do this. My heart breaks for you. But let me just tell you, you can be the one that can be relentless and say, yeah, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna go and do this. And you know what can actually happen? And I've seen this happen in my own family with my cousin to her dad. When their life is changed, it can often change the perspective of the parent. It can be the actual thing that brings about change in a person's life. My cousin prayed, prayed for her dad, shared the gospel with him, and eventually he gave his life to Christ. Oh gosh, I'm getting, I looked at my dad, that was a bad idea. <laughs> I'm starting to get emotional just thinking about it. This man who was angry and an alcoholic is a radical follower of Jesus because of, my, because of the life change that happened with his daughter. It can happen. Okay, so as a parent, you, you do it, you go for it. And then the last one, you might say, oh, we're too busy. We just got way too much going on. If that's the case, let me say, like I said earlier, You've got to cut something out because this is the most important thing that you could be doing. It doesn't mean that you need to spend all of your time doing this. It needs to be the foundation by which you do everything else. So if your kids are involved in, you know, 10 different things, you make sure you have that time that you carve out as a family to study and teach them these things. And that all of those other things, you teach them that while you're at soccer practice, you're a missionary for Jesus. While you are at band practice, you are, you are a missionary for Jesus while you are there. That we teach them these things. That we can, you can find ways. You can carve out time. But don't let busyness be the reason. Because then that's when busyness becomes the idol. And we start to worship that instead of God. And that is a very dangerous place for all of us to be. So I want you to take a moment just to visualize for a minute here visualize what you, you know, if you have young kids, okay, or even think about when you were a parent, a young parent, what did you visualize for your kids? What did you, what did you want them to be when they grew up, when they became adults? Or if you're a young parent, what do I want to see my kid become? Or if you're not currently married, don't have any kids, you might say, I don't know. I, I don't know what I visualize. I want you to think about it. And I want you to, all of us, and I'm meaning myself too, to start to reset our priorities to say, I am going to make it about following Christ. 
that my kids be a passionate follower of Jesus and that along with that, I teach them and we talk about how God has wired them, God has made them and then encourage them in those things so that they pursue a career and a, a field that is along those lines so that they can do that for the glory of God. We start first by saying, I want them to be passionate followers of Jesus. And then if they wanna be a weatherman, if they wanna be a surveyor, if they wanna be a teacher, a pastor, a professional athlete, whatever it is they wanna be, that we say, but first and foremost, you love God first and you do that all to the glory of God and you do that on mission for Jesus. And so remember, because we wanna see that happen, we wanna see our kids follow Jesus. Let's remember what we said at the beginning, that healthy parenting is designing all things related to your home so that you are cultivating a lasting legacy of faith in your children. Let's pray. God, I'm just so thankful, God, for who you are. God, you are such a good God. We love you. We love what you have done. We love that you have given yourself for us so that you would give us a whole new life and we would be radically changed by the gospel so that we could follow you and God as well, we want to pass on this faith to our children. So God, we ask that you would lead us, that you would guide us, you would show us the way, you would give us um, wisdom and what to do. God, patience and grace when um, our kids reveal that they do have a sin nature in their heart. But God, also that we would do it all with a vision of the future to see them become passionate followers of you. God, that is the most important thing that we could ever do. So God, we thank you for this and we pray this all in your name. Amen.